Thanks for tuning in. I'm Michael Watson, and this is the Influence Watch podcast. In this episode, clashes break out between the socialist regime of Nicolas Maduro and supporters of Venezuela's democratic opposition, a controversial Chicago program is challenged in court for violating property rights, and politicians propose a plan to hike taxes to pay off their consultants. Venezuela erupted into violent clashes this week, as supporters of opposition leader and U.S.-recognized constitutional acting president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido, battled forces loyal to the country's ruling socialist dictatorship. We cover the constitutional questions in episode 58. By ruling Maduro's fraudulent re-election invalid, the legislature, the National Assembly led by Guaido, deemed the national presidency vacant. As president of the assembly, Guaido became the constitutional acting president. The problem, of course, is that most of the Venezuelan military, which Maduro and his predecessor, the one-time darling of Western socialist Hugo Chavez, purged of officers whose loyalty to the regime was suspect. The military has not defected in the numbers necessary. For more on the background in Venezuela, Capital Research Center made a short video, Venezuela's American Support, and how the American far left fell for the false promises of the Chavez-Maduro regime's increasingly anti-democratic socialism. But the uprising showed some dissent in the armed forces. Opposition figure and longtime political prisoner Leopoldo Lopez was broken out of prison. He's now holed up in the embassy of Chile. And Guaido, backed by military forces loyal to him, rallied at an airbase in the capital Caracas. U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo alleged that regime figures were negotiating an arrangement for Maduro to flee the country, but, per Pompeo, quote, the Russians indicated he should stay, close quote. Other reporting has suggested that Maduro was guarded by forces from communist Cuba. President Trump threatened diplomatic and economic retaliation against the Cubans if they continued to prop up Maduro's regime. So, as of recording time on May the 1st, where do things stand? Maduro's regime, backed by Russia, Cuba, and a number of other hostile foreign powers, continues to hold power. Guaido's situation is unclear, though Lopez has the protection of Chilean diplomats. The Lima Group, a coalition of Western Hemisphere nations seeking a peaceful resolution to the crisis, will meet Friday, May 3rd, on the crisis. Pompeo also suggested that if the situation deteriorates further, U.S. military action, quote, is possible though he said the U.S. was, quote, trying to do everything we can to avoid violence. What will happen next? We can fashion four plausible broad scenarios of varying likelihood. First would be the best-case scenario. Maduro goes in this round of clashes, which unfortunately is not very likely. Maduro retains too much support with the armed forces and the secret police, perhaps best exemplified by military forces running over pro-democracy demonstrators with armored vehicles, during demonstrations on Tuesday. The second would be Guaido failing and being killed or arrested by the military. While this outcome remains possible, the support Guaido has shown from military dissidents and the foreign support other opposition figures have received from the U.S., Chile, and the rest of the Lima Group nations provides some protection for, at the very least, opposition figures at the top level like Lopez and Guaido. There's also the possibility of a cold civil war with periodic clashes. This honestly seems most likely, if only because it is the current status quo. It would continue the despair and privation suffered by the Venezuelan people under the socialist Maduro regime. And perhaps the worst-case scenario would be a hot civil war, possibly triggering a massive refugee crisis. If Guaido has some support in the military but not enough to depose Maduro, this becomes dangerously likely. Colombia is already straining to handle Venezuelans fleeing the current civil disorder, a generous work and movement freedom plan designed to facilitate economic opportunity for temporarily displaced Venezuelans, is giving way to the construction of tent cities. Full-scale conflict could send people fleeing across the Americas. Preventing this nightmare scenario, which commentary magazine's Noah Rothman called Syria Next Door in a 2017 warning article, is why the U.S. should remain involved in the crisis and should seek a democratic transition from the Maduro regime to new, free elections. Closer to home, if you thought civil asset forfeiture, the controversial legal proceeding by which the state can seize your property if the government thinks it was involved in crime and not have to prove its claim in criminal court beyond a reasonable doubt, was bad, Chicago has a sketchy legal system that puts those violations of property rights to shame. The city will impound cars from people who manage to beat even the unfair asset forfeiture system, and being the innocent owner of a car driven in or ridden in by someone else 
doesn't help you get your car back. You also have no right to counsel in dispute proceedings, and the city, which faces a fiscal crisis, is using its scheme to raise revenue. If that sounds like an abuse of due process and property rights to you, it also does to the libertarian lawyers at the Institute for Justice, fresh off winning a Supreme Court case that applied the Constitution's excessive fines clause to the states and to asset forfeiture cases. So, on behalf of three owners of cars impounded under Chicago's unfair and arcane procedures seeking class action status, they sued the city, alleging that the administrative penalties the city assesses violate state and federal limits on excessive fines, state and federal guarantees of due process, and state and federal guarantees against unreasonable seizures. To get an idea of how this system works, consider the case of Spencer Bird, a Chicago-area auto mechanic and case plaintiff, whose car was seized under Chicago's impound program. In 2016, Bird was giving a client a ride in his car when he was pulled over by the police and searched. Bird had nothing illegal, but his passenger had some drugs. Bird was released without charge, but the cops took his car. The state of Illinois moved for civil forfeiture of the car. Despite the many procedural hurdles to defeating the civil forfeiture, Bird managed to beat it. But he didn't get his car back. The city's impound system held it, and an administrative hearing found the impound legal. Remember, Innocent ownership isn't a defense in these Chicago hearings. If you think that's bad, the other named plaintiffs in the case, a married couple, lost their car after a car repair shop employee drove it on a suspended license while they had nothing to do with it. Ultimately, innocent car owners should not have to pay for the misdeeds of others, as Chicago currently requires. The Institute for Justice seeks to set this right for the citizens of the second city. And in our final item... Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, inspired by a municipal ordinance in Seattle, America's most politically left-wing city, has proposed raising taxes to pay political consultants. Okay, not exactly. She wants to raise taxes to provide up to $600 to every voter to contribute to candidates who promise not to take more than $200 from any single individual. The goal is straightforwardly partisan. Gillibrand suggested that the only thing standing in the way of government-run socialist health care, a massive payoff to the teachers' unions, and a better economy, as if the far left knows how to bring one about— was political contributions. Lawrence Lessig, a left-wing Harvard professor and advocate for electoral institutional changes that would benefit Democrats, praised the proposal. Laying aside the sheer ridiculousness of funneling taxpayer monies into the pockets of political campaign consultants, which would be an inevitable result of this proposal, should we support a system of totally unmoderated funding of candidates by exclusively small donor activists? The evidence from McCain-Feingold, which neutered the political parties as activist entities and supporters and vetters of candidates, is not auspicious. Instead of clean elections, taking money out of the parties instead led to the creation of personal political machines outside the parties, like those of Tom Steyer, Michael Bloomberg, and Charles and David Koch. And small donor activists are a small and unrepresentative portion of the voting public. They may be more radical than the voting public. As the American Enterprise Institute's Jay Koss noted at National Review while discussing the small donor-powered campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders, quote, Are grassroots extremists pulling candidates to the ideological fringes by increments of $20 apiece? It's very possible. Institutions, businesses, political parties, and organized advocacy groups are self-interested, but it's not obvious that they're necessarily more out of step with the public than small-dollar activists. Past efforts at campaign regulation sidelined institutions for often extremist megadonors. Consider the differing approaches of Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who has the power to lead impeachment, but not, as of recording, any particular desire to start impeachment proceedings, and, quote, need to impeach megadonor Tom Steyer. Institutions are moderating forces, even far left institutions. The SEIU is left wing, but the smaller and more radical industrial workers of the world would be even more left wing. I would advise caution before we set off on a utopian plan like Gillibrand's to sideline even more institutions. That's our show for this week. If you're listening to this on YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you have subscribed, thank you. And please leave us a five-star rating. We'll see you next week.